right about time to bring you up to speed with what's happening globally and in Nigeria. We begin with electoral and political matters. Iran prepares for presidential runoff amid low voter turnout. Crucial issues quantified in UK 2024 election. Pro-Palestine protesters kill Australia Parliament House. Biden struggles to counter threats to his re-election bid. An oldest artwork found in Indonesian cave. Stay with me for these more stories. On electoral matters, a giant mural in downtown Tehran is usually a good sign of the mood in Iran. Looking over the bustling Velsuya Square, it displayed ballistic missiles and might one when Iraq attacked Israel in April. In the days leading up to the runoff presidential election on Friday, it showed alarm over the depths of voter apathy. It surely make a difference. It read showing reformist backed centuries Mozud Pasekian and hardliner Said Jalili. The mural came up after 60% of at least 61 million eligible Iranians choose not to vote in the first round of the snap election on June 28th, marking a record low turnout since the country's 1979 revolution. In a change of rhetoric, Minister of Interior Ahmed Vahidi marked valuable public participation after the vote rather than claiming an epic showing as officials had even when late president ibrahim Raisi was elected in 2021 with a then record low turnout of 48 percent Raisi died along with seven others including minister of foreign affairs hussein amir abdulayan when their helicopter crashed in a mountainous area on may 19th most iranians are disappointed in the aftermath of deadly months long protests in 2022 and 2023 and as people are squeezed daily with one of the highest inflation rates in the world. Numerous are questioning whether their vote will have any real impact. Seeing the apathy and considering the fact that conditions are unlikely to considerably improve in the short term, the candidates and their supporters have been mostly maneuvering on attacking each other rather than presenting actionable plans. The, the Pazishkian camp has maintained that the ex heart surgeon and longtime lawmaker will be able to make things marginally better, whereas a Jalili presidency will set Iran back decades. Jalili has emphasized that he must become president so his opponents will not usher in former reformist minded officials whom he blames for Iran's current dilemmas. The aim has been so much on attacking the rival camp that Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei said this week candidates must refrain as it will only hurt the country. But two more televised debates this week. The first one-on-one -on -one talks held since 2005 presidential election were no different. The moderator, who was accused of favoring Jalili, sees the candidate's brother is the deputy chief of state television, will remain silent for long periods as candidates descended into shouting marches numerous times and disregarded their allotted times. Still taken with electoral matters today, people across the United Kingdom are going to the polls at a time when the country is facing major challenges from the state of healthcare to the cost of living. The incumbent Conservative Party, led by Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, is expected to lose, creating the way for the country's first Labour government in 14 years. According to Ipsos, a multinational market research and consultant firm, the top five issues respondents identified are healthcare and the National Health Service, NHS, 41%, the economy, 33%, immigration, 30%, inflation, 29%, and housing, 17%. Healthcare ranks as the foremost issue confronting the UK today, with four in ten respondents rating it as one of the most important, according to Ipsos. Both the Conservatives, casually known as the Tories and Labour, have said that dropping wait times in the country's publicly funded NHS is one of their major priorities. The past 15 years have, been, have seen the worst income growth in the United Kingdom for generations, according to the Institute for Fiscal Studies, IFS. Tom Waters, an associate director of the IFS, said in late May that it has been slow growth for essentially everyone rich and poor, old and young this means that even while income income inequality has been stable progress on reducing absolute poverty has been painfully slow 
long-term net migration, which measures the number of people moving to the United Kingdom minus those leaving, has reached record levels over the past few years. By the end of 2023, long-term net migration to the UK was approximately 685,000 people, closely three times as high as a decade ago. Of those people, Indian nationals topped the list at 250,000 arriving in the United Kingdom to stay long-term. This was followed by Nigerians, 141,000, Chinese, 90,000, Pakistanis, 83,000, and Zimbabweans, 36,000. Some of the other issues people in the UK find pressing are declining government spending on education, increased foreign spending on defence, the impacts of inflation on poverty levels, a lack of faith in government and the level of crime in some areas. Away from electoral matters, now on Israel-Gaza war, pro-Palestine protesters have climbed the roof of Australia's Parliament House in Canberra and unfurled many banners, one of them reading, From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. The demonstrations at the National Parliament on Thursday followed recent divisions within Prime Minister Anthony Albani's Labour government, which suspended a Muslim senator who crossed the floor to vote in favour of Australia recognising a Palestinian state. Four people from the renegade activist group dressed in a dark clothing stood on the roof of a building for about an hour, rolling out several large black and white banners, including one reading, No Peace on Stolen Land. One of the protesters gave a speech using a megaphone accusing the Israeli government of war crimes in Gaza with the support of the United States and the Australian government of being complicit in the alleged abuses. A handful of police and security advised people not to walk directly under the protest at the Marco entrance to the building, while more were seen on the roof attempting to remove the group. The fragest war in Gaza began when Palestinian fighters from Hamas burst into southern Israel on October 7th, killing some 1,200 people and taking about 250 others captive. Israel's war on the besieged Palestinian territory has killed nearly 38,000 people forcibly displaced most of the population multiple times and laid waste to the densely populated enclave. South Africa has lodged a petition at the International Court of Justice, ICJ, accusing Israel of committing genocide against Palestinians in Gaza, while a United Nations inquiry last month found that both Israel and Hamas committed war crimes in the early stages of the Gaza war. The inquiry also said that Israel's actions constituted crimes against humanity because of the immense civilian losses. Since the war erupted, Australia has been the site of many post-Palestinian protests, including weekly demonstrations in major cities and a months-long occupation of university campuses. On Monday, the Labour Party indefinitely suspended a senator, Fatima Payman, after she voted in favour of a parliamentary motion backing Palestine. Palestinian statehood. Payman said she had been exiled after supporting the motion put forward by the Greens party in deviance of government policy. Australia does not presently recognize Palestinian statehood, although Foreign Minister Penny Wong said in May it could do so before a formal peace process between Israel and Palestinian Authority is complete. Back to electoral matters on 2024 election in the United States, no president has ever required a public holiday like Joe Biden needs July 4th. Biden is fighting frantically to save his political career by rising deviance, but he's in danger of being swamped by a rising tide against his, um, him rather, as more Democrats express doubts that he can beat Donald Trump after a disastrous debate performance. The president will assemble family members who will like who will be his will be key to his future deliberations on his re-election campaign at the White House for Independence Day. In so need of a slow news that day will allow him to regroup for potentially the most critical 48 hours of his political career. As speculation burst on Wednesday that he may be considering pulling out of the race. Biden unequivocally declared that he was in it to win. He then met 20 Democratic governors at the White House to try to prove he has the energy and acuity to win and lead for four more years. 
On Friday, Biden was seat for an interview with ABC News that's now shaping up as an even greater challenge than the CNN debate, given his need to put in a nibble and forceful corrective performance. Biden's swing state campaign stops will, like his every single public appearance now, be pressed for any slip up or sign of vulnerability that supports the impression that Biden created for himself on the debate stage of a diminished commander in chief. But the hard margin reality for the president is that the assurances, shifting explanations, and spin that his political aides have come up with so far are not working because there may be no answer to his predicament. The image of an incoherent, weak, and bustling president was said on the minds of 50 million viewers a week ago. And even a far more competent damage control effort than the White House and the Biden campaign have mounted so far we have struggled to erase that impression. Efforts to explain his fights in Atlanta are only refocusing attention on the car problem. Super majorities of voters doubt he's fit enough to serve a new term that will end when he is 86 years of age. On Wednesday, for instance, the White House picked up Biden's line that he was jet lagged after two trips to Europe in early June. Given that the president had been backed on U.S. soil for over a week at the time of the debate, this only begged fresh questions over whether he's up to the onerous demands of the presidency, which frequently needs extensive travels. The idea that delayed jet lag in combination with the call that aides said he also had could cause Biden to trail off in the middle of sentences and fail to make a coherent case on issues basic to his campaign did nothing to arrest his political slide. On history, scientists have found what they believe to be the world's oldest outward portraying three people assembled around a large red peak in a cave in the Indonesian island of Sulawesi. Research published on Wednesday shows the painting was created some 51,200 years ago. Maxim Abort, an archaeologist at Australia's Griffith University and co-author of a new study published in Nature, said according to report that this is the oldest evidence of storytelling. Abort was part of the team that identified the former record holder, a picture of a warty peak thought to be at least 45,500 years old. The newest discovery found inside the Ling Karumpuan cave in the Marus Penkeng region of South Sulawesi is in poor condition. It shows three people around a wild peak measuring 92 centimeters by 38 centimeters, that's 36 inches by 15 inches, in a single shade of dark red pigment. There are other images of peaks in the cave as well. The juxtaposition of the figures, how they are positioned about each other and how they are interacting were deliberate and it conveys an unmistakable sense of action Something is happening between these figures. A story is being told. We don't know what that story was, said Griffith University archaeologist Adam Broom, another of the study's authors. Obert speculated that the paintings were probably made by the first group of humans who moved through Southeast Asia before arriving in Australia about 65,000 years ago. Earlier, the first narrative art was thought to have emerged in Europe. The date given for the Indonesian cave art is quite provocative because it is so much older than what has been found elsewhere, including in Europe, said Chris Stringer, an anthropologist at London's Natural History Museum. Stringer, who was not involved in the research, said the experienced team's findings looked, some, looked sound but required to be confirmed by further dating. On more stories, Putin Xi praised China-Russia ties at security summit. On Wednesday, Russia's Vladimir Putin and China's Xi Jinping lauded their country's growing alignment as they met at the gathering of a Eurasian security bloc promoted by both leaders as a counterbalance to Western powers. Putin said Russia-China ties are going through the best period in their history and should be considered a stabilizing force for the world in opening remarks ahead of a bilateral meeting with Xi on the sidelines of Shanghai Cooperation Organization SCO's annual leaders summit in Kazakhstan. The Russian leader also underscored Moscow and Beijing's roles at the cradle of the SCO's founding in 2020, 2001 rather, 
as the two powers drive a transformation of the bloc from a regional security club with an emphasis on Central Asia to a geopolitical counterweight to Western institutions led by the United States and its allies. Belarus, a staunch Russian ally that assisted Moscow launch its 2022 invasion of Ukraine, was formally admitted by the SCO on Thursday as its 10th member report from China said. The Eastern European country is the newest authoritarian state to join the SCO after Iran became a full member last year. The bloc underwent its first expansion in 2017 to welcome India and Pakistan. The meeting marks the two leaders' second face-to-face -face talks in just two months following Putin's visit to Beijing in May and comes shortly after the Russian president hit a landmark defense pact with North Korea. Much to the consternation of the U.S. and Europe, China and Russia have deepened their political, economic and military ties since Putin and Xi declared a no-limit partnership in February 2022 when the Russian leader visited Beijing weeks before his full-scale invasion of Ukraine. China has exceeded the European Union to become Russia's top trade partner, offering a vital lifeline to its heavily consumption economy. The two nuclear-armed neighbors have also continued to hold joint military deals, including with Iran. Meanwhile, the U.S. has accused China of providing Russia with dual-use goods that boost the wearing nation's military-industrial complex as it attacks Ukraine, which Beijing denies. In his opening remarks on Wednesday, Xi told Putin that China and Russia should keep upholding the original aspiration of their lasting friendship in the face of an international situation fraught with turbulence and changes. Xi also hailed the unique value in China-Russia relations, urging the two countries to make new efforts to safeguard their legitimate rights and interests and the basic norms governing international relations. On Wednesday, Xi said China supported Russia's rule as BRICS chair this year in uniting the global south, stopping a new Cold War and opposing hegemonism, according to reports. Talking climate crisis, Hurricane Beryl hits Jamaica's south coast. A powerful hurricane has hit Jamaica with heavy winds and rain destroying buildings and felling trees on the Caribbean island. Beryl, a category 4 storm with winds of up to 130 mph, struck the island's southern coast. At least seven people have been killed so far as the storm sweeps through the Caribbean. A hurricane warning is in effect in Jamaica where the authorities have enforced a curfew from 6 o'clock to 18 o'clock local time. Prime Minister Andrew Holness earlier urged people to take this hurricane seriously. In Grenada, where it first made landfall on Monday, three people died, one in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and another three in northern Venezuela, which was hit by strong winds and flooding. Around 90% of homes were destroyed extremely damaged on Union Island, which is part of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Parts of Jamaica earlier experienced disruption to power and electricity supplies, with the Jamaican public service company JPS saying it was forced to post restoration of power lines in some locations for the safety of the workers. Dr. Michael Brennan, the NHC's director, said Jamaica will experience devastating hurricane force winds Rainfall in some parts of the country could hit 12 inches 30 centimeters, potentially leading to flooding and mudslides. The director explained why life-threatening storm surges as high as 9 feet 2.7 meters above tight level are also expected. Jamaica's Information Minister Dana Morris Dixon said the island had 900 shelters to house people who needed to leave their homes. A government delegation was hit by a falling tree while inspecting damage. President Nicolas Maduro said Vice President Delcy Rodriguez were among those wounded. In Mexico, where hurricane burial is expected in the coming days, residents in Cancun have rushed to supermarkets to stock up supplies. Some have encountered empty shelves. In the shelves of Africa, Kenyan police patrol safe streets of Haitian capital. On Wednesday, the streets of Port-au-Prince were towed by Kenyan police officers equipped with body armor and automatic weapons. This group, the initial United Nations supported foreign police unit in Haiti, arrived in the country in June, responding to a plea for aid to fight rising gang violence.
presently criminal gangs dominate around 80 percent of the capital leading to more than 580,000 individuals being displaced in recent months the officers stationed close to the international airport drew the attention of onlookers but encountered no confrontations with gangs Haiti's Prime Minister Gary Canil stated gratitude for the multinational security support mission, stressing the urgent need to address the violence perpetrated by armed groups. On June 25th, a contingent of hundreds of Kenyan police officers landed in Haiti to participate in the multinational security support mission aimed at battling armed criminal gangs and restoring peace in the country. They will be soon reinforced by police and military personnel from the Bahamas Bangladesh, Barbados, Benin, Chad and Jamaica bringing a total number of personnel to 2,500. Mariah Isabel Salvador, head of the United Nations Integrated Office in Haiti, stressed the importance of this deployment in line with Security Council Resolution 2699, offering a glimmer of hope for the people of Haiti. In part two, I'll bring you stories from Nigeria just after this break. Please don't go anywhere. Welcome back. Now stories from Nigeria and again on climate crisis in Nigeria. 10-hour rainfall flood cripples Lagos house collapses on Wednesday in many parts of Lagos and Ogun states. Businesses and commercial activities were grounded following a 10-hour downpour. The resulting flooding brought down a two-story building in the Mushin area of Lagos hindered vehicular movement on the roads and overwhelmed thousands of residents while people's not attend schools in parts of the state. Though the Lagos state government said the rain lasted for nine hours, in some parts of the state it began at midnight and did not subside until noon, making it 12 hours. Such places include Bega, Ikeja, Ogba and in some parts the rain lasted for 10 hours. According to reports, affected flooded areas such as Iyana, Uwuru, Agege, Ijegun, Isheri, Oshun, Bagbada and Lagos Island in Lagos State, roads and houses were flooded as a result of long hours of downpour. Other flooded places in Lagos include Eredo, Bojije, Ekpe, Sango Tedo, Ibejuleki, Awoyaya Labura, and Ipojun. More places include Atan Ota, Oseshe, Ifo Sangota, and Ijebode in Ogun State, and major roads were submerged, making them impassable and leaving passengers stranded. The Permanent Secretary of Lagos State Emergency Management Authority, Olufemi Oke Oshayitolu, stated that the seven victims were rescued alive from the collapsed structure. He attributed the collapse of newly constructed building to the inclement weather. Due to the unpredictable weather conditions, the La Cima boss also urged Lagos residents to remain calm and avoid any non-essential travel. And finally, on the news on health, on education rather, as to braces as non-academic staff strike begins today. Once again, the subsisting industrial peace in Nigerian public universities is set to be crushed as the Senior Staff Association of Nigerian Universities, SANU, and the Non-Academic Staff Union of Universities, NASU, are ready to begin a nationwide strike today due to withheld salary arrears of their members. On June 20th, 2024, the Joint Action Committee, JAC, of NASU and SANU had sent a letter to the Minister of Education, Professor Tahir Maman, informing him that the members will begin a work boycott in two weeks if their demands were not met. In a letter jointly signed by NASU General Secretary Prince Peter Adeyemi and Mohammed Ibrahim, the unions accused the government of negligence and insincerity. They lamented that despite the pledges made by the Ministers of Education and Labour and Employment to pay their arrears, the federal government had continued to dribble us even after the mutual agreement to suspend the one-week warning strike in March this year. This is just as the Academic Staff Union of Universities, ASU, is mobilizing all its branches nationwide for a strike despite high-level deliberations with the Minister of Education, Professor Tahir Maman, about one week earlier. According to report, ASU branches across the Federation are actively mobilizing their members 
in anticipation of a directive from its national body to embark on strike. Recall that the federal government and the lecturers union had pulled pin ultimate Wednesday ended their closed door meeting with an agreement that all contentious issues will be amicably resolved about a strike. As to President Professor Emmanuel Osodeke, who led the union's team after the meeting, said the negotiation process had started and stated the hope that the federal government will follow up on what had been agreed on. But the union, according to the report, lamented that all the issues that led to the eight-month strike had not been addressed by the federal government. According to the union, some of the issues are the renegotiation of the 2009 FGN stroke ASU agreement, the backlog of end academic allowance EAA and astounding salaries. The branch chairman of ASU, University of Abuja, Dr. Silvanus Ugo, said his branch was fully mobilized and waiting for a directive from the national. A recap of major stories on electoral matters. Iran prepares for presidential runoff amid low voter turnout. Crucial issues quantified in UK 2024 election. Pro-Palestine protesters kill Australia Parliament House. Biden struggles to counter threats to his re-election bid. And oldest outwork found in Indonesian cave. And that's all on the news. Thanks for watching. I am Lois Turecki.